Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Sophie uh, calling in from Berlin in Germany. Happy to be here. And sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, so I'm going to talk about zero trust security in APIs. And I loved, and I, the first thing I thought about was uh, Spy vs. Toy. For those who know it, fabulous comic. Um, yeah, to jump in, um, I'm working for Euro Hermes as head of API, so I have the um, API governance, API developer relations, all this stuff. And um, for those who don't know Euro Hermes, we are a company that exists like for more than 100 years. So we're coming from this time where um, insurance looked like this, these oak desks and paper stuff and everything. Um, of course, the world has changed ever since. And that's a good thing. So um, I will quickly um, talk about what we are doing because it will help you better understand why APIs are important for us. I try to be quick and not to, to bore you with it. So um, let's imagine there's two companies trading with each other. So the left company is selling goods to the right one. Or there goes the little ship goes there and an invoice goes with it. And then it takes a little time, maybe 60 to 90 days in business, that's normal. And then the invoice is being paid and everybody's happy. But let's imagine um, that little ship goes again and the invoice comes again and then it takes a little time and it takes a little more time. And uh, ooh, unfortunately, um, right company went bankrupt before they could pay their invoice. And now, unfortunately, the money is gone for the left company and that can be a very difficult situation. And this is actually what we ensure. And uh, so in this case, uh, we would then pay left company and there would not be a problem. Um, nice so far. Um, of course, left company has more than just one customers and then we would secure all these customer relationships individually. And then when you look at this in a more global context, then you see millions of transactions going on worldwide, companies trading with each other in need of security and there's also some other market players like marketplaces brokers and such which we can partner up with and there you you get the big picture and of course you can imagine that um, for the sheer volume of transactions to be insured the old oak wood desk is not the appropriate medium anymore um, we need to have apis and that's why insurance looks more like this Today, um, this is our brand new developer portal um, that we built. Um, by the way, thank you to Krista from Prodovex. They helped us um, tremendously. I'm super happy with that. Okay, but uh, the talk is about zero trust. And um, now you may ask yourself, why zero trust? IT security was managed for ages. Why do we need something new? Um, well, here's why. Um, IT security for in the, in the past looked pretty much like this, uh, like a fortress with like high walls, thick walls, and then there's this steep um, um, spacing between the public and the, the fortress. Uh, maybe it could be filled with water and sharks inside and super secure. Nobody can enter um, except uh, through the one entry gate, which can even be pulled up to isolate everything to be super secure which is um, quite nice if you have this um, monolith architecture and if you work essentially to do things internally in your castle. And I would consider it a bit like a, a marketplace that you find inside the, the fortress, which means that once you're in and um, you made it through this entry gate and everything, uh, you find this marketplace where you have pretty much access to the platforms which are interface with technical users. Uh, so once you can access one platform, then you basically get all the information also from the others because you're considered trusted um, because you're inside. Um, and then over time, um, some additional things needed to be do, done. So you could not just stay in your castle, you had to build an online portal. So you had to dig a little hole in the wall to connect your 
online portal for the outside world, super secure still with IP whitelisting and the likes. Um, yeah, but yeah, that wasn't really made for collaboration and microservices. And if you now look at a new architecture where the monoliths would be replaced by microservices, um, already you get more complexity in the connections in, inside the castle, of course. Um, you need to, to give the, the access to your portal to all those microservices. And, and then again, microservices are built for collaboration and not, not just to stay inside the castle. So you need to build plenty of holes in your security wall to let people connect to your microservices. And then, especially if your partners, they are on the cloud, then uh, they will ask you to grant um, wide ranges of IP addresses. And basically, the protection of your famous fortress is not usable anymore. It goes bust. Uh, so that's a shame for, for this nice castle that we don't have anymore. Instead, what we get is uh, what we call the zero trust architecture. And what it means actually is that at each API calls, you need to check at four levels. Um, first one being very basic check, the, the web application filter, the WAF, and I love this WAF expression. Um, that's of course very simple um, checks on the, on the API gateway level to just prevent from people spamming you or denial of service attacks, all this kind of stuff. Pretty basic. Uh, next, you need to identify who is that person calling your microservice. You need to do that securely. Um, then you need to check the authorizations for that person. If it's he or she allowed to do what she um, wants to do. And finally, you also have functional checks, which are more at the microservice level. And um, these are more business related checks. For example, if um, the user requests to do an action on a product that doesn't suit that product, you need to also refuse that, um, that request. Um, so, and then what I'm gonna um, deep dive is what I call the fun stuff because it's a bit more complex to, to implement, which is uh, the ID checks and the authorizations stuff. So um, looking into the ID checks, um, let's imagine we have our nice um, microservices, four of them here, and we want to connect them to the outside world because that's what they are built for. So in a classical scenario, and what we originally thought of, probably we would just take an API management. It's like the, the box that does everything and um, have the APIs connect through that to the outside world and they will be secure. It will be easy to do and that's nice. However, um, as we're not only doing API-based uh, interaction with partners, there's also an online portal, um, which is then used by the same customers. It brings in its own user credentials management, and it will connect to the same microservice, but maybe not necessarily through the API management tool, because we don't want to pay at each transaction the license fees. Um, and we can do that because the online portal is what we would build ourselves in our protected private cloud. We could do that. And we could do likewise for the inside application, our internal tools. We could do all that. Um, thing is that unfortunately this would pretty much resemble to the, the castle that we just destroyed and we don't want to get back to this anymore. Um, what we wanted to do is, um, yeah, basically, first of all, we wanted to open source. That's a different thing. Um, we wanted to clearly know who is calling our microservices at any point in time. And also, we wanted to have one approach that fits all. So we don't really want to have this technical differentiation between internal and external user management, um, because we believe we don't need it. So. 
if we now have the, the uh, microservices, we want to connect them to the outside world. Um, as we happen to use Amazon Web Service, um, so we do have the, the gateway that comes with these um, services. So we can just use that. And then when we create our online portal for our customers, we don't really create a, a, an application of portal like we did in the past. We basically just build screens that um, visualize what you find in the microservice in terms of functionality. And uh, we can do that in different functional ways. So we do the same for the developer portal. And also we do the same for the internal application. And that's the, the main difference. Basically, we treat all users, all applications in the same way um, on the cloud, public cloud outside. Um, of course, we need to secure that. And um, we chose, because we wanted an open source solution, we chose uh, WSO2 to do that, the ID server. Meaning um, that whenever somebody is calling, we will check the ID on this tool. Now, there's one thing that we um, added that we said to ourselves, it's nice to have a technical ID for all your users, but it's even nicer if you link that technical ID with an internal um, user identification process. So we uh, federated with our Active Directory, which, which is managing the, managing the internal users, the, the staff of Euro Hermes, um, going through an HR process so we really know who they are. And um, we do the same for our customers and partners where we use Salesforce. And so uh, you have a, a KYC process to, to know whom you're actually dealing with. And this is, of course, not just an inside-out thing where we do uh, the process manually inside your Hermes and then, you know, those users. It can as well be triggered from the outside. So, for example, when you create uh, a login on our developer portal, what's going to happen is that it calls an API, the, the create user API, which will feed into the KYC process before then creating the contact and the ID on the ID server. And by doing that, we are safe that whoever is calling an API, we know who that is, and we know he or she is uh, securely identified. Um, one other important thing at this level is uh, roles. So we are not just managing identities, but we are also giving roles to those identities. So as an example, um, an internal staff would have the role internal, very creative, and um, that would allow to access all our microservices. Probably, maybe not in this example. Um, another role would be for our API developer, for example. Uh, in that case, we would allow the creation of an API key, that service, but not the other ones. Or you can have a, a customer role. And in this case, you have uh, the other three microservices. You get the picture. And of course, a user can evolve from one role to another um, if there's a business reason to do so. And uh, so this gives us a first level of security um, for our zero trust infrastructure. Nice. The next challenge is um, authorizations then. And um, I try to visualize why it is a complex thing. Um, authorizations will depend on the business that you run. They can be very different. In our case, it's typically contracts. You have one or several insurance contracts um, that you signed. And if you use our products, you're authorized to use those. Okay, so good so far. Um, of course, in the contracts, there might be different features and we might want to authorize not the total package, but on each feature. 
or um, when we do that, we might also authorize somewhere between read, or write, or both, or even admin rights. Um, well, the contracts in our case, they are in hierarchies. So you need to understand that hierarchy to, to authorize, for example, on hierarchy one, and then you get contracts one and two, and you can see all of them. Um, yeah, and, but, but if you do that, of course, there's also exceptions. And you see the, the complexity is continuously growing. And, and what I show here is just very high level. The reality of our authorization system is it's much more complex than what I have, um, what I could put on, on such a slide. And um, that's why we, we have created this kind of architecture. So when, when the API call is coming from the custom portal, he did uh, uh, an action on the portal. The API is calling um, to the gateway. We check the identity. Um, so we say, yes, you can call that microservice for the feature that you wanted to use. Now, the microservice will call, um, just have a, a check if to see if the, if the token is valid. That's a pretty um, technical thing. And then the microservice need to run through those um, authorizations and understand, is that user allowed to do what he wants to do? And we, we find that, uh, of course, if we let the microservice crawl all that information, it will be a lot of um, complexity to be implemented. So we um, package it in, in an application that we call the resource manager because authorizations can be um, managed on all kinds of resources. Um, and it will only say yes and no to the microservice. And that makes this uh, thing much simpler. The microservice is saying, okay, that customer wants to um, ask for credit limit coverage. Is he allowed to do that? And resource managers say, yes, we can do that. And um, to, to do that, the resource manager has a database where all the authorizations are documented. And for performance reasons, there's also a denormalized um, variant of that. Um, because we need to be really fast in responding to that um, inquiry. Yeah, and, and that's about it for that second challenge. Um, and Sophie, yeah, we, we need to wrap up. So if you can, uh, you know, make the third challenge uh, as a conclusion. Please. Oh, oh, sorry to hear that. Okay, um, so um, I need to then click more rapidly. Um, just to say, the, the good thing is if you attack one microservice, you don't get it all. And the same goes for the portal because you're only authorized to, to um, individual resources. Um, you need to look at performance because you create a single point of failure. So this must be super scalable and everything. Um, you need to be flexible in the roles that you create to not uh, block your business. Uh, you need to do governance to control that. So automation is key in deploying your APIs with that security framework. Um, but what you get is then simplification. So it's very easy to connect your APIs to that framework. Um, you have full auditability on your um, infrastructure and um, you're cleaning up your data. So you have no redundancy in your users. Sorry, Danny. Um, you have a clearer, um, cleaned up picture on your data, so you don't get the mess that you have in your legacy already today. And finally, if you revoke an account, well, then the user is completely blocked and you're secure that he cannot do any activities anymore. Thank you. That was the speed version.